The Alabama Booksmith presents Author Spotlight. Because every book in our store is signed, our wall of fame displays a breathtaking array of writers and signatures. Close-up shots reveal giants of literature, acclaimed historians, stars of stage and screen, our nation's leaders, famous sports heroes, and thousands of other esteemed authors. Today's Wall of Fame guest is Connor Town O'Neill, who will discuss his new book, Down Along with That Devil's Bones, a reckoning with monuments, memory, and the legacy of white supremacy. And here is Connor Town O'Neill with our host, Jake Reese. Well, hello, Connor. It's just great to have you here in Birmingham. We appreciate you taking time to come by and visit. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's good to be with you. And uh, before we uh, talk about your book, tell us about your family, your new family. <laughs> yeah, my growing family. Uh, just two weeks ago, my daughter Olive was born. Uh, so my wife Shailen and I are, are busy nesting right now. This is really my first venture out of the house since, uh, since she came home with us. Well, we, are, we are honored to uh, have you here, and I know you'll want to get back there so we'll uh, get you in and out uh, after we cover everything about your incredible book that we love so much. Uh, Sounds good. That you have spent the last five years of your life researching and uh, writing uh, I think about one of the most controversial figures in American history. Um, and in what may be the greatest juxtaposition for the genesis of a book I've ever heard. Let's talk about your visit to Selma, Alabama on March 7th, 2015. Why were you there? March 7th, uh, 2015, that's 50 years to the day uh, since the, the march that's come to be known as Bloody Sunday, uh, where uh, nonviolent uh, demonstrators were attacked on Selma's Edmund Pettus Bridge um, at the height of the civil rights movement during the, the voting rights campaign. Um, images of that of that attack uh, beamed into homes across the nation and helped really catalyze support uh, for the Voting Rights Act that was passed later that year. And it's really an iconic moment of the of the civil rights movement. And uh, Selma commemorates that anniversary with a, a crossing of the bridge each year. So on the 50th anniversary of that. Uh, of that day, President Obama was in town uh, to mark the occasion with a speech and to, to cross that bridge. And so I was there to report on that anniversary. Uh, as you might imagine, President Obama's in town, a whole lot of other people showed up too. And that small city is you know, suddenly overflowing with people and, and parking was at a premium. So, uh, <laughs> so your first job is finding a place to park your car. That's right. And that's where it all began. And so tell us, where did you park your car? And then after you tell us about a simple little thing of parking your car, describe the next few minutes after parking your car. Sure. So way more than I bargained for. Um, <laughs> so Selma has just near downtown a pretty expansive cemetery, one of those cemeteries with, you know, that has its own system of roads. So I think, oh, maybe there's a place I could sort of stash my car in over there. So I pull into the cemetery and happen to notice these signs all across the cemetery that says, uh, Confederate Memorial Circle closed, uh, do not trespass. And you know that's catnip to <laughs> that's catnip to a reporter. So that piques my interest, and, and so I, I wander over. There's some people um, doing doing work, you know, sort of maintenance work on the um, that section of the cemetery, and I meet uh, this group of people who call themselves the Friends of Forest. Uh, now, I'm a Yankee. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't schooled on military history growing up. Forrest, Nathan Bedford Forrest's name faintly rang a bell, but you know, not much beyond the association with Forrest Gump. <laughs> but boy, did they give me an education in Forrest. And this group uh, had basically spent the better part of two decades fighting to uh, 
put up and then replace a statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, who uh, to them is, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the word here, uh, to them is a revered military general, uh, sort of salt of the earth, blue collar hero, um, known as the wizard of the saddle. Uh, but he was also a slave trader. He was also an accused war criminal during the Civil War and afterwards served as the first Grand Wizard of the Klan. Uh, so you can imagine putting a statue of him up would be controversial anywhere. To do it in Selma, which is you know synonymous with black voting rights, is you know all the more so. On that day. <laughs> On and to be to be out there in public, you know, getting ready to to put up a replacement statue of Forrest uh, on the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, like you say, is just an incredible juxtaposition. I sort of got whiplash from the, the dissonance of it. But, you know, that moment, of course, then stayed with me. This chance encounter with the Friends of Forrest really stuck with me um, and prompted me to, to look into Forrest's life, read up about this controversial To look monument. in and read up you spend a half a decade <laughs> looking in and reading up. Uh, and for those in our audience who uh, might not know, uh, because of the title of your book, calling Nathan Bedford Forrest the devil uh, was first attributed to uh, William Tecumseh Sherman uh, and has been repeated for generations, but uh, certainly for different reasons. <laughs> Prior to uh, getting down with that devil's bones, let's talk about some other bones that are really buried in that Selma Cemetery. There's so much in your book that is fascinating, and one of the most fascinating characters was Elderly Todd Dawson. Tell us about Elderly Todd Dawson. So uh, Elodie Todd Dawson grew up in Kentucky, and you might recognize that, uh, that name Todd there. She was Mary Todd Lincoln's uh, half-sister. And so while uh, Mary married <laughs> the, uh, that ambitious lawyer from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Elodie married Nathaniel Dawson, who uh, was an Alabamian uh, a secessionist, a uh, uh, Confederate soldier. They uh, they met at the uh, uh, Jefferson Davis's uh, inauguration as the president of the Confederacy, um, and exchanged letters throughout the world throughout the war. Um, Elodie actually sewed the flag that Nathaniel's unit marched off I to war. That. Yeah. Um, and after after the war, uh, Elodie became a leader in a group called the Ladies Memorial Association, a predecessor to what we now know as the United Daughters of the Confederacy. We'll talk about those ladies shortly. <laughs> yes. And so she, uh, she was, uh, helped organize um, what became Confederate Memorial Circle, which is the place that I met the Friends of Forest some 150 years later. Um, <laughs> But she was a real advocate for what we now call the lost cause uh, vision of, of the Civil War and Reconstruction um, that, that painted the Annabelle South as uh, you know, a place with uh, kind master, benevolent masters and, and happy enslaved people um, and that saw black leadership in Reconstruction as inept um, and corrupt, uh, a, a, vision of, a vision of our history that really took hold, but that doesn't bear, doesn't really bear out when, when you take a, a, a square look at the facts, but it, it proved uh, incredibly influential. A lot of, uh, like Elodie and the Ladies Memorial Association, United Daughters of the Confederacy groups across the South, um, really ran a campaign to, to spread that vision, that lost cause vision uh, of the Civil War and Reconstruction in, you know, textbooks and of course in helping to build uh, these Confederate monuments that started to go up after the war. Well, we'll, we'll talk about the daughters in just a moment. Uh, I read in the book that uh, uh, Elodie had three brothers killed in battle at Shiloh, Vicksburg, and uh, Baton Rouge, and uh, her sister Emily's husband uh, died at Chickamauga, and of course her half-sister Mary's husband died at Ford's Theater. Uh, what a book. Uh, as we 
get to your lead character, your readers uh, learn that statues of Nathan Bedford Forrest abound in a lot of places other than Alabama. And I love that you point out there are 31 markers of the general uh, just north in Tennessee. And in that same chapter, you let us know that although three presidents are from Tennessee, statues of all those three presidents combined don't come close to equaling the devil. Uh, tell us and remind us of the three Tennessee presidents. So the three Tennessee presidents are Andrew Johnson, uh, Polk, and Andrew Jackson. Um, and, and yeah, their, their, uh, their, their legacy, at least in, in terms of public symbols and historical markers, uh, don't, don't equal up to the ways that, that forest still exists on our, uh, on our roads and courthouse squares and interstate uh, interstate shoulders. Uh, forest is really everywhere. When I talk to uh, the novelist Madison Smart Bell, uh, who has written a novel about Forest, a great novel about Forest uh, called Devil's Dream, um, he uh, he told me that growing up in Middle Tennessee, Forest was just the water that you swam in. That he's really uh, he really sort of saturates the the lore and you know the, the historical markers of that state. <laughs> It's, it, it's all fascinating. Let's take a light moment from all this history and revisionist history and uh, allow me to get personal for a moment. Uh, we read that you were the only white kid in your kindergarten uh, back home in Pennsylvania. And so when parts were assigned uh, for the play about Rosa Parks, naturally, the teacher thought you would be perfect as... The arresting officer. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, just so appropriate to the uh, history that many uh, hold dear, that uh, the white kid is the arresting officer. Uh, you uncovered quite a battle over Forrest at the second largest university in Tennessee. Uh, I found that also, fa I've used the word fascinating so many times. Let's chat a moment about that uh, university fight. Yeah, so that fight took place at Middle Tennessee State University, which is in Murfreesboro. Uh, and there, they have a long history of uh, uh, using symbols of forest and, and of the Confederacy uh, more broadly. In the 1960s, they actually, their mascot was a student who would dress up as Nathan Bedford Forrest <laughs> and, you know, would uh, ride a horse on the sidelines of football games. Um, they had a, a big medallion of forest on horseback that hung in the student center for decades. Uh, he used to be on their stationery. He's strewn oh. through their yearbooks. Um, and basically, uh, as the, that university integrated in the 1960s, um, black students started to really challenge the university on uh, their use of those symbols of, of forest and of the confederacy and and slowly but surely were able to um, make change in that regard. Uh, uh, not using Forrest as uh, the mascot anymore, not playing Dixie at the, the, as a fight song uh, with the, the pep band, uh, taking down that medallion. Uh, finally, the sort of last outpost that Forrest had on that school's campus uh, was Forrest Hall, mm -hmm. the, which is the name of the ROTC building there. And in the 2015-2016 academic year coming out of the, the aftermath of the, the Charleston Nine murders as, uh, you know, across the country people were protesting Confederate symbols. On MTSU that meant protesting Forest Hall. And so student activists on campus really mounted a challenge to, to get the school to, to change the name of that uh, and, you know, sustained pressure uh, throughout that that school year and eventually got the school 
to agree to change the name, the Board of Regents that oversees the university to agree to change the name, uh, but that wasn't enough but. to get it on. <laughs> but, but. but um, there's a there's a state law in Tennessee that requires any any change to uh, monuments or memorials of, of historical uh, value to uh, get the approval of the state's historical commission. And so the school applied uh, and were denied permission to change the name. So Forest Hall is still Forest Hall at MTSU. Um, you write that the um, revisionist history of the lost cause was uh, perpetrated long after the war by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, that this group sponsored essay contests and uh, erected monuments, goodness, all over the place, uh, and more importantly, wrote school textbooks. It uh, <laughs> sounds to me like uh, they waged a more successful campaign than uh, did the Army of Northern Virginia. Yeah, that's right. I think, you know, it, the the Confederacy suffered a military defeat, but their their ideology long outlived Appomattox, um, and the ripples of that, like you say, come out for really far um, and in, in many different ways. And that that ideology that, that has us think about um, the, the antebellum South through rose-tinted glasses, um, you know, benevolent masters and, and contented enslaved people, um, just, you know, it, it was perpetuated, but really doesn't bear out when you, when you scrutinize it and, and hold it up to historical, historical facts. So, so yeah, I mean, that campaign that the UDC was central to um, has, really, has really held for long over a century now. To, to this day. To this and, day, that's and, right. Uh, I don't imagine you would want to argue the point with uh, many folks who uh, are believers well, I, there's been plenty of arguing for sure. I mean, I think it's it's hard. What part what part of what's hard about it is that we don't we have not settled on a single collective uh, way of remembering the Civil War. I mean, there are there, there our collective memory about that is not so collective really. I mean, I think we have two um, two really disparate versions of, of, of looking at the Civil War and our, ability, or our inability to, to come to terms on how to remember the Civil War, why it was fought, and, and the consequences of why it had to be fought um, mean that we're going to keep having arguments like this, you know, until we can settle it. Um, if enough people read your book, that will help go a long way. Well, <laughs> I hope so. One of the uh, great prizes of the work these organizations uh, have accomplished is uh, the longest constitution on the face of the earth, the uh, Alabama Constitution of 1901. And the politicos at the time stated their motivation was to establish white supremacy. And for all these 119 years, uh, it seems to have fulfilled its purpose. Talk just for a minute about that document, please. Yeah, so, so after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, we, it did really f seem possible that we might overcome the legacy of uh, being a slave society and, and, and fully invest in a multiracial democracy where the formerly enslaved people were included, uh, vested political power, the, the right to vote. Um, but that didn't last but about 10 years. And, and after Reconstruction, um, all of those rights were, were, were clawed back. And in the decades since, uh, states like Alabama rewrote their constitutions. And as Alabama did in 1901, did so with the explicit purpose of re-enshrining re white supremacy in the state, which meant things like uh, you know, disenfranchising black Americans and, and really you know, betraying uh, the possibilities of reconstruction and um, meaning that even though, like we were saying, even though the North had won the Civil War, um, that ideological victory stayed with, with the Confederates. Uh, while this is a serious book about a contentious subject, uh, your writing style embraces what I call deliciously clever humor. <laughs> uh, included 
uh, with the statues, plaques, and monuments uh, dedicated to the memory of the devil uh, are a couple, I think, worthy of mentioning uh, here. Tell us uh, about the shrines uh, to where Forrest rested and uh, where he got directions. <laughs> So there's a there's a marker outside of Murfreesboro, which is where Middle Tennessee State University is. There's a marker on the roadside there that enshrines this patch of grass <laughs> on the oh, roadside uh, where Forrest rested. So um, while he was about to lead a raid on Murfreesboro, um, saving some of the the town leaders from uh, from Union soldiers, for which he is. Uh, revered by some people in Murfreesboro to this day. Um, he, it was a dawn raid, and so the night before he, he stopped outside of town to rest. And I guess they tracked down just where he, he stayed for a little cat nap and felt compelled to mark that place with, sure. um, with, a, with a plaque commemorating that, um, and, that rest. And we, we in Alabama are very proud of Emma Sampson. Tell us about that, that plaque. So Emma that Samson, statue. Yes, that statue. Uh, Emma Sampson was a teenager during the Civil War, and uh, Forrest, who was a cavalry leader, was in hot pursuit uh, of uh, of a, his, you know, Union uh, Union foes, and uh, needed was looking for a, a place to cross the Black Creek there. Uh, and Emma Sampson, a teenager, uh, gave him directions, pointed out a, a, a narrow place there for, for him and his men to cross. Uh, like, the, uh, like the place where Forrest rested, a seemingly uh, minor, minor detail of the Civil War, uh, but one that is, uh, one that is fiercely remembered uh, by, Forrest, uh, by Forrest admirers. They go to great lengths to document uh, at least the military aspects uh, of his record. And so, Emma Sampson honored with a plaque uh, <laughs> where she's yeah. pointing. She's you know reenacting her her. They whipped that away. <laughs> <laughs> Without debate, the ugliest statue of Forrest, maybe the ugliest statue of any Confederate officer, or for that matter, any person, place, or thing, uh, is right outside of Nashville. It's uh, gaudy and plastic, and the sculptor uh, continued his work for the cause long after finishing that graven image. Uh, there's a whole book waiting to be written about Jack Kershaw. Give us the abbreviated version of the statue and the sculptor. That's right. So uh, Jack Kershaw uh, really touches on a, a number of, of flashpoints in the sort of uh, aftermath of the Civil War, what I call a sort of cold Civil War, where it's not a military conflict anymore, uh, but the, the, the struggle about whether uh, white supremacy will be perpetuated in this country uh, through in the courtrooms, in, in school classrooms. Jack Kershaw is central to a number of those battles. Uh, so in the 1950s, he led uh, the the fight to resist school integration in Tennessee. Uh, in the 1990s, he founded a group called the League of the South, which is a neo-Confederate secessionist group. Um, and that's when he sculpted this uh, really uh, astounding and astoundingly ugly statue of Forrest that sits on the roadside of I-65 in South Nashville there. Um, and then, uh, Sandwich between those two in the 1970s, he uh, served as James Earl Ray's lawyer, the man who uh, assassinated Martin Luther King. So he he's a sort of uh, uh, Zelig type figure who pops up at all these moments of uh, you know civil rights and civil war history um, throughout the decades. Well. Um, can't wait to read your book about Jack Kershaw. And uh, we're, while we're talking, we're showing the image of the statue, and it is something to behold. <laughs> uh, we love your book. It's um, smart, it's entertaining, it's chock full of information every American needs to know. Uh, and as each reader turns the last page, uh, 
maybe our country will take a step forward in understanding and coming together. Congratulations. Uh, we appreciate your taking five years of your life to give us this life lesson. Thank you for uh, visiting today and thank you for signing all our books. Oh, thank you so much. It really, it means a lot to, to for this book to find readers and readers like yourself who, who really um, take it seriously and ask such thoughtful questions. I appreciate you taking the time and, and appreciate your support. Well, I, I think when it, when it is published and folks get to read it, you will be inundated by thoughtful questions. So, Sign first editions of Down Along With That Devil's Bones, A Reckoning With Monuments, Memory, and the Legacy of White Supremacy may be purchased at alabamabooksmith.com.